The NFL Draft is finally here. We're two days away. Thursday night, the big event has finally arrived. And I'm back again here with my good friend Stone as we do our final predictions for this NFL Draft. Stone, how are we doing? Are you excited for the draft? Yes, I know both of us are extremely excited. We've done so much prep, so many mock drafts that you can check on the channel. I think like three or four at this point. And this is the final one, predictive mock. This is going to be it. And it's kind of bittersweet, but I know both of us are really excited. Always a great time of year. And this one, we do have our consensus. So I'm still going to do the odd picks. He's going to do the even, but we went through before recording and we kind of have an agreement on how we think at least one scenario the draft could play out. So that's kind of what we're going to be modeling here for you guys today. But the Chicago Bears are up first, and I'm going to have a shocker for you guys. It is going to be Caleb Williams out of USC. I think this has been a really a slam dunk pick since it was known the Bears were going to have this selection probably since what, last November or last early December. So the Bears get their quarterback of the future. Not much have to say about this. Justin Fields traded. They need a, they need a quarterback. Williams, highest ceiling in this draft, and he's going to go number one. No doubts about it. Yes, no shocker there. Uh, and I think you had had a video before about the potential Bears future. There's not too many fans, I would say, that should be... Obviously, every fan is excited, but uh, just if I'm a Bears fan... There's not many more fans that would be more excited for my team than the Bears. Uh, going into next year, I think they're going to get over whatever random stuff they're going to think about Caleb Williams, all the random draft stuff going into the year. I, I just think it's all BS. Uh, I think he's going to be very good. Teammates are going to love him. Uh, going to be a stud. Caleb, easy pick there. Uh, and number two, it's it's been 50-50, essentially, for us. Uh, at least, kind of. Uh, we've had Drake May going second a lot. And as the draft slowly creeps in, there's been a lot of potential rumors about whether it's May or Daniels. There was some sort of issue, apparently, uh, with uh, Daniels' agent and the commanders. What's up there? But we're going to go with kind of what has been the sign from the beginning. And I think it's a slight trend towards Jaden Daniels as the number two overall pick for LSU. Obviously, you know both of us do have May 2nd, but this is, again, a predictive mock so we're going based on obviously what makes sense but also potential rumors that are out there uh, so with Washington probably leading a little bit more towards Jaden Daniels especially with their offensive scheme with Cliff Kingsbury we'll have him go to the Washington Commanders at number two yeah I mean most of the mock drafts we have done we've had Drake May go number two because that's really seemed like the logical pick I mean I know you like Drake May a lot I like him a lot as the number two quarterback but there's just been so much regarding Daniels to the commanders. The betting odds always have favored Daniels going to Washington. You mentioned the whole agent thing. Does that sway their pick last minute going back to Drake May? Who knows really what the commanders are thinking? I don't think really anybody except for the people in that building really know what exactly is going to happen. But just kind of based off of the betting trends and what most draft analysts and other beat writers for the team are saying, it does seem like Jaden Daniels is going to be the pick. And the thing that sucks about these predictions is one pick really messes up the entire board. So if Drake May does go number two, it's already been rumored that the Patriots at number three, they could have a lot more value for that pick with the team, you know, wanting to move up for one of those quarterbacks. So it's going to be really fascinating to see what happens at the top of this board. I feel like most drafts, we kind of know who's going to go top three. I mean, last year we knew it was going to be Bryce Young, CJ Stroud. We knew it was going to be those two. We didn't know exactly the order, probably until a day or two before the draft. But we did know it was going to be those two quarterbacks. This year, there's really three quarterbacks that could go in these first two picks. And we don't exactly know still who those are going to be. But I'm just going off of all the trends. But that's my prediction for this. And number three with the Patriots, I went back and forth on this. You can ask Stone. I was really debating having the Patriots move out of this pick. There was a lot of talk on Monday about the Patriots moving back. And uh, Robert Kraft kind of giving the keys to Jonathan Kraft a little bit, his son. And him just kind of wanting to paint his own picture regarding the future of the team. Maybe moving back, getting more picks. But I'm going to have them stick and pick here and have Drake May going number three overall. I just cannot fathom the Patriots and the Commanders just saying no thank you to Drake May, who is a supremely talented quarterback, fits the mold of previous guys that we've seen enter the draft, has shades of you know Josh Shown a little bit, has shades of Justin Herbert a little bit, and for two teams to pass on him, I just it's hard for me to see that. So I'm gonna have the Patriots making the right pick here, 
and taking Drake May. Yeah, I, I think that's probably more realistic. Um, if you don't know my opinion of Drake May, go watch my studs and steals video, the first one. Uh, I definitely love Drake May. I know both of us do. Um, and it'd be very interesting. Uh, apparently the Patriots are open, but it's going to take a legendary haul for a team to go up. So personally, I do think it's kind of worth it, but I understand if teams don't really want to give up that much capital. Um, so also with the Patriots, I, I think it'd be kind of just a little bit crazy to pass on this this kind of prospect here the next quarterbacks and the next what draft class next year and after we have no idea 100 percent what they're going to be you know so i think just take the guy that's here because he's worth the pick so patriots i think they're saying all the stuff that they can just to leverage their options but they will eventually probably stay and i think both of us agree on that and number four is probably where the trades potentially start happening uh, i definitely think it could be a trade here but we had ended up going with that they stay and just take the best player. Um, I, I do think they have been, or I know that they've been talking about trading, but any of any of them could happen. Let's just have them stay and get definitely the best player that's not named Caleb Williams, and it's Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah, this is another fascinating decision we had to make if we wanted to have the Cardinals move back, if we wanted to have the Chargers move back, if we wanted to have any of these teams move back. It was really hard to pinpoint exactly what these teams are thinking but when i just view the cardinals they already have a pick in the 20s from you know the trade with the texans last year do they really need to trade back get more assets and miss out on a potential generational wide receiver i just can't see them doing that when they can get a blue chip great you know player with pedigree has all you know the skills and talent that you want at that position to come to your team it just makes too much sense so i'm gonna have the cardinals sticking and picking harrison at number four and then the Los Angeles Chargers. This is another prime trade down spot. And I do think this is where the Minnesota Vikings move up. They move up right before the New York Giants. There has been some talks. Hey, maybe the Giants want to move up two picks with the Cardinals and sure they can get JJ McCarthy. I personally don't buy that because they don't have a lot of assets for one. And two, they're kind of in a must win year. Brian Dayball, Joe Shane, in their third year, their ownership group has not been reluctant to fire coaches pretty quickly. There was rumors about him and Wink Martindale kind of them not getting along and that's why he ended up leaving after this season. So I do think there's a little bit of pressure there for the Giants to have some success this year and drafting a quarterback at number four, that's not going to help them win next year. So, so I do think the Giants, they can't really afford to move up and it's not really smart for them to move up. So I do think they're going to stay at six and that just leaves the Chargers as really the team, kind of the odd man out, I guess you could say with the Vikings moving up, probably giving up 11, 23, and I'll say maybe 157 for pick number five, something like that works. And we're gonna force this trade through and the Minnesota Vikings are on the clock and they are going to take JJ McCarthy. I talked about this a little bit with Stone and we kind of went back and forth about it a little bit. I'm not exactly sure if the Vikings are gonna do this just because for two months, all we've heard is the Vikings are gonna trade for McCarthy. The Vikings are gonna trade for McCarthy. The Vikings are going to trade for McCarthy. How often does a team really put out there or is it leaked their exact plan for a draft? It does not happen very often, if at all, regarding a team and a quarterback. So that's something I'm a little bit curious about. I do think the Vikings really want Drake May. And that's why I really wanted to potentially have the Patriots move down. The Vikings move up with them and take Drake May. But then I'm like, man, are the Patriots really going to do that? Like, it's so complex of how many things could happen during this draft. So I kind of went the safer route and had May going three and I have the Vikings moving up for a quarterback. I do think they're going to take one. I do think they're going to trade up. Again, it's just, is it going to be for McCarthy or are they going to try to give an absolute haul to the Patriots to move them off of that third selection for Drake May? That's just kind of what I've gone back and forth with. I decide with JJ McCarthy. What are your thoughts about that, Stone? Yeah, I think the only two teams that would potentially trade up for a quarterback within this top four to five range are the Vikings or the Giants. And the most likely team, it's the Vikings. They already made the trade to get the second first round pick. I understand what you're saying. I do think, though, there's probably some sort of trade already in place with a team, and they are kind of just seeing what the Patriots and the Commanders are going to do at two and three uh, because maybe if this is different or if the uh, Vikings are like oh my god we love Drake May maybe they do give up enough to go get him at number three but 
I think realistically the top three is Pry here. And if you're looking at these guys, you know, the Giants could look to jump them, but I think they're kind of just trying to leverage and potentially make the Vikings pay a little bit more with the, the Giants maybe being like, hey, we could go get JJ. Uh, but we've been through this song and dance before with JJ. Everyone's already seen it mocked. Everyone obviously thinks it's too high, but is realistic. And I just think while he's obviously not the fifth best player, the Vikings is the best place a quarterback could go this year. And I think being able to sit, if he does that, it'd be the pretty much the perfect spot for him. And I think that would be where we would be able to see his full potential, which I think is still kind of unknown in terms of what he could really be, which is kind of exciting, uh, especially for Vikings fans. Uh, I know some may not want him to go this high, but trust me, you have a great infrastructure for a new quarterback to come in. I I don't think you're giving up a ton in terms of like getting a quarterback. You might have to give up more in the real draft. Again, we'll see. But I I do think Vikings JJ is probably the most realistic pairing there which moves us to the Giants at number six of which they have been linked to this receiver it could be the other one as in Rome but it's pretty much been neighbors the entire time Uh, I have said before and I said on one of my mock drafts the mock draft where it was what I would do low-key Odunze fits a little bit more because he's not a slot receiver and the Giants kind of have slot pretty well like uh, Wanda Robinson's a good slot receiver they like neighbors more don't really want to nag and pick on it at all totally understand it. he's a phenomenal player so we'll just have neighbors go six to the giants yeah that's something that's been a little bit interesting as well as with neighbors and kind of what teams view him because there has been some medical red flags apparently about like his shoulder i saw a report about there's been some off the field reports as well about some concerns about who he's hanging out with and all sorts of stuff around that so It's interesting. I don't know what teams view what, and we're not in the draft rooms to know who the Giants have ranked as, you know, their number two wide receiver. But according to some of their beat guys, it does seem like Malik Neighbors is getting the edge at this moment. We'll see if that changes. I could see a Dunze as well, but Neighbors at number six definitely makes sense. And then the Tennessee Titans at number seven, I'm still going to go Joe Alt. It just makes too much sense. They need help to tackle. They've been surrounding Will Levis with talent all offseason long. Really the last big piece they have to incorporate into that, that team is a tackle and joe alt he is the consensus tackle one i have seen some other draft analysts talk about how it's not a super wide gap between alt and maybe you know fuaga maybe fatanu it's not a huge gap so maybe the titans they could elect to maybe move back because they do need some draft capital because they traded for the jerry sneed they moved up for will levis last year the coverage is a little bit bare in terms of their draft picks so maybe the titans don't view alt as maybe tackle one by a huge margin. They want to move down. They want to get some more picks and then they take maybe tackle two or three off the board. But who's really going to move up here for Alt? Could it be a team like the Chargers? We just decided the best and safest pick to go is having Joe Alt go here since he has just been mocked to Tennessee pretty much all off season. So Joe Alt, he's going to end up in Tennessee. Yeah, seems like the pretty easy pick, to be honest. I think the only world he doesn't go here is if he goes higher with the potential chargers if they stay there that'd be very interesting but uh, i think realistically this is probably the best spot for him and and probably where he will go Uh, then we have the falcons at eight and we i had kind of gone on this curve of like okay it's gonna be dallas turner to oh maybe it's not gonna be dallas turner maybe they could trade back maybe they could do some stuff and now going back to like I have no idea, but I'm just going to take Dallas Turner (laughs) because I think there's a lot of different stuff they could go. I think this could be a trade back. I think this could also be apparently rumors of Byron Murphy. But if you just look at the team, there's no reason why they would take a defensive interior. It just makes no sense. Uh, Their cornerback, well, their defensive interior players are older, but I don't think you would use a first round pick on someone who is just as good probably as a prospect as any of the edge rushers so I I think Dallas Turner it seems like he has been the number one player on their board I I know a lot of people have mocked it but it's coming from somewhere so it's not like their Falcons you know clearly have another guy on their board and no one's knowing it maybe that's the case but it just seems like Turner is the best edge there Uh, but if this is not Turner I I think it's just a trade down it probably is Uh, or if you want to go crazy Quinion Mitchell at eight sure i would totally be fine with that Uh, but we had to go through every single option and realistically 
if it's not a trade down, uh, I think Dallas Turner would be the position. I know some people want Romo Dunze. I, I just don't think you need to use another first round pick on a weapon. I don't. <laughs> Kirk Cousins is going to be good and your weapons will not be hindered by him. In fact, they will be, you know, increased just by his presence in general because you've had terrible quarterback play. So go get the defender. It seems like it's Dallas Turner. Let's not overthink it. Let's just make the pick. Yeah, there's been a lot of smoke about the Falcons. It also came out today that they might lose some draft picks for tampering for Kirk Cousins. So maybe that's another incentive to have them trade down. But a team like the Falcons who do still need help, they haven't really had a good edge rusher since like Vic Beasley. I was looking up their history of pass rushers a few days ago. Vic Beasley had like one crazy like 17 sack season. Outside of him, they really haven't had a guy off the edge. And I don't think here taking Byron Murphy, although he has also picked up some rumors, who knows? There's just all sorts of things, probably three or four different rumors for every single team. You just have to figure out what's really true. But when I just look at the Falcons roster, like you said, why would they take an interior defensive line when they already have two solid starters? They all they are a little bit older, but where's Byron Murphy going to play? Is he going to start over one of those veterans and move him to the bench? It doesn't really make sense to have three defensive tackles that roughly do the same thing. So I think edge rusher does make a lot of sense if they decide to not trade back. And Dallas Turner, as really what happens in the draft usually, he has a high ceiling, probably not the highest in the draft for an edge rusher. But when you're picking inside the top 10, you want to balance risk and ceiling. And Dallas Turner has the best of both worlds, in my opinion, when he has a high ceiling, but he also doesn't have the injury concerns of Leitu Latu. He also has a little bit more of a higher ceiling than somebody like Jared Verse. So he makes a lot of sense to be the first edge off the board. And that brings us to the Chicago Bears with pick number nine. And I'm going to have them select Byron Murphy the second. He's been a pretty popular player. I've mocked to them the last couple of times. And the reason for that is there's, again, a huge hole on the interior of their defensive line. I'm just kind of using simple logic here. The Falcons, massive hole at edge rusher. The Bears, massive hole at their defensive tackle spot. So Byron Murphy, who is the best defensive tackle in this draft, in my opinion, I think he could slip into the top 10. There has been some rumors. I think it was Peter Schrager, maybe, that came out and said, I can't remember exactly who what analyst it was. It might have been Schrager. But he came out and said, I think Byron Murphy has a good chance to go inside of the top 10. And if you look at the board, who are really the teams that could take him? Well, we just mentioned the Falcons, but the reasons why they probably wouldn't do that and then the Bears, they desperately need some help on that defensive line and defensive tackle. They, they traded for Montez Sweat, so a pass rusher, it's not a huge desperate need, although they could add another one, of course. You always you know, want more and more pass rushers, but if Byron Murphy's going to go inside the top 10, I think the Bears make the most sense, and I'm going to have that mocked here. Yeah, I've actually never had him in the top 10, but I do like you know just having it for the draft because, as you know, not I don't want to say this is definitely not crazy Byron Murphy but just saying what we think is going to happen hardly ever happens and so there's a lot of picks in the draft that are probably going to be crazier than this mock draft both our mock draft and ones that I might do and ones that Mathis might do separately so uh, it's going to be crazy but I do like having the pick for the Bears it makes sense it could be an edge rusher but if they do say hey one already went you know, we don't value the others as high, which is possible. Um, I think this is a pretty realistic and good pick for them. Uh, then we have the Jets at 10, which if you're looking, I, I think realistically, would you say, are they more likely to take Bowers, you know, just in general over any player? And I would say yes. And I think a lot of other people agree, but not if Romo Dunze is there. And based on how this draft fell, with a team not trading up for Odunze, going quarterback heavy early, and potential defenders being prioritized with rumors that are going on. And again, I just don't think it makes sense for th these guys to take a wide receiver, either of them. Uh, again, could be Bowers, might be Bowers, but if there's a world where Rome falls, he's not falling past the Jets. Because it does make sense for them to take wide receiver, because they just need the best weapon. And I think the value of Odunze as a wide receiver is higher than the value of Bowers as a tight end, even though Bowers will still play part tight end, part wide receiver. Uh, they are not married to Mike Williams. I know people are going to be like, they just got Mike Williams. He's what? Almost 30, if not 30. He played three games last year. He's hurt almost every single year. There's a reason he was not a priority free agent and was signed on a one-year deal. Garrett Wilson can play the slot for sure. And now they get another weapon that Rodgers wants because I think the Jets are probably going to take a weapon. 
as you know, I would take O-line. That's just my opinion. I had had it in some, you know, other mocks because I think you need to protect the quarterback, but I just don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to do the crazy, shiny play, which may not be wrong. It's kind of like the Jamar Chase, Panay Sewell thing from a few years ago. Both ended up working, um, but one quarterback's hurt right now. So we'll see how it goes in the future. But if Rome falls, I would not shame them for making this pick. He's a total stud, and I think this would be a pretty insane receiving duo uh, slash trio for New York if this happens. Yeah, so the Jets are a pretty fascinating team. There's been a lot of rumors of really connecting Brock Bowers there, and you know that does make sense, but it raises the question, Aaron Rodgers is going to have to sign off on it because he does not like throwing to young players because he doesn't have you know, the built-in chemistry with him that he has with Randall Cobb and Alan Lazard, you know, some, you know, veteran, okay receivers, but he just doesn't have the same trust in his younger guys. Could that be a reason why the Jets elect to just take an offensive lineman? Well, I have kind of mocked that and every single mock, I think up until really maybe one or two ago, I had them taking Troy Fatanu, somebody that's just versatile, can play either tackle spot if one of their older guys gets hurt. He can also start at guard to start the season while both of those tackles are healthy. I was just thinking that was a better route for them to go, but I do think if Ardunze or Bowers are on the board and Rodgers signs off on it, I do think one of these guys will be a New York Jet, and with them in win-now mode, they might just say, screw it, we want to get a guy that's going to help us immediately and be able to play from day one. And if they take a tackle who can't maybe be a full-time starter at guard, maybe they don't want to have a guy start on the bench, be like their sixth lineman, maybe see that as a wasted pick. And I, I do like Adunze over Bowers here, just getting another threat to combine with Garrett Wilson and inevitably replace Mike Williams once he does get hurt on that MetLife turf. And now the Los Angeles Chargers. And Chargers fans, I have to warn you, you guys are going to be a little bit upset, but I want you to direct, at least for this pick, I want you to direct your hate for Stone, all right? Because this was Stone put me onto this, and I'm going to have our second tackle off the board, and it is not going to be Talisa Fuaga. It is not going to be Troy Fatanu. Do you know who it's going to be? It is going to be J.C. Latham out of Alabama. I'm going to have him go here, number 11 of the Chargers, and simply to put it, Jim Harbaugh, Joe Horowitz, they love to run the football. We look at the previous team that he was with at Michigan, I guess it's, you know, college, whatever, but they ran the ball. And you look at JJ McCarthy, who, you know, is talked about now. Hey, can he really lead an offense? Is he just going to be a game manager? The reason for that was Jim Harbaugh's offensive scheme. He wanted to run the football. So I think, again, the Chargers are going to try to build up that offensive line. They've already signed a couple of veteran running backs to bolster up that unit. I could see them going with the tackle here. Maybe it's not Latham, but there has been a lot of talk about the Chargers really liking him. They really showed a lot of interest in him during his pro day. So this could be an interesting connection where Jim Harbaugh says, you know what? I've seen this guy. I played against him in the college football playoff. I'm going to take JC Latham as our tackle to combine with Rashawn Slater. And while I wouldn't do that, I would probably take Brock Bowers or maybe even a different tackle on the board. Things get weird in the draft. So, Stone, defend your reasoning for Latham you know, going here. Well, you basically said all of the points for me. Those were all the points I had made. But a lot of it's based on rumors. That's kind of it. We are doing a predictive mock draft, and they have met a lot with J.C. Latham. And it's reported that their priority is offensive line. And I think it kind of makes sense. Like, like you just said, Harbaugh... My point was made, you know, if we're believing these rumors that, you know, how did you most recently win? And it was by running the ball through the trenches. They just signed two running backs, obviously both from his brother, former Ravens, but they that was a high priority for them. So they clearly want to try and run the ball and use play action a lot. And they have wanted offensive line. That's kind of been the thing. And the two guys they've meant the most with are J.C. Latham and Joe Alt. And I think if they don't trade down, while I would probably take receiver, would it shock me if they took Joe Alt at five? No, if they stay there. And if they trade down, I could see them trading down again here. But Latham has been liked a lot more by NFL just execs in general uh, and scouts. I, If you'd like to know my opinion of J.C. Latham, go ahead and watch my most recent mock. I guarantee you, uh, you're going to be like, why is he going so high in this one then? Because I'm not as high on him. But again, it's predictive. And this is kind of what we've been hearing 
from LA and we got to have some crazier picks. So I, I think Latham going to the Chargers would be kind of like a oh shocking pick, but it doesn't seem like Jim and them really care about the, the real value of like, oh, these guys think this guy's ahead. Like this O-line class is pretty close and some guys might have Latham too. Others might have him at six. It, it varies a ton. Um, but I, I will say there have been other mocks like Mel Kuyper earlier in the year had the Chargers taking J.C. Latham at five, which was crazy at five. So uh, it's definitely realistic. Obviously, I wouldn't do it either, but that's kind of the thinking behind it. And that's what we've been kind of uh, alluding to, at least the ch- what's, that's what the Chargers have been alluding to uh, in terms of what they might do at 11 if they trade down. Uh, and now we're going to go to the Broncos at 12 and while this is obviously a weird spot as well you see Brock Bowers on the board they need quarterback Um, I I think they just need capital so we're going to have the Bengals trade up they're going to give up 12 and or no they're going to get 12 and 145 they'll give up 18 and 49 which is the second round pick the value pretty much equals out and they're going to go ahead and get Brock Bowers now, I think if they stay, they're probably looking at an offensive lineman, whoever's there. Uh, the Broncos might want to get Bowers, but we had discussed it beforehand. It just doesn't really make sense for them to do that. Uh, it makes more sense for them to trade back, and they could still maybe get the player that they're looking at at 12, probably. Um, and the Bengals, they want to make big-time moves. They want to try and make slash win the Super Bowl. While I think offensive line is definitely a priority, I think a lot of teams might view Bowers as a can't miss guy if he falls out of the top 10 i know the colts really love him as well the jets if he's there and nodunze is not there he might be gone but in this scenario where all of this stuff ahead of us happens which is very realistic and could happen i think cincinnati is like hey let's go up and get this guy he's a stud uh t higgins might not be here next year we don't know bowers isn't really a tight end he's kind of like just a weapon in general and i think tight ends are are People don't value them as much as they should. I think you should look at the the past few Super Bowls and like who's played in them. Their tight ends have been pretty vital parts of their offense. So I think he's going to be a stud. And the Bengals, I don't think they'll regret trading up for Bowers if he falls this far. Yeah, the quick rationale for this, I don't want to spend too much time on you know the Bengals getting Bowers, but it's really just if Bowers makes it past the Jets and the Chargers at 10 and 11, really the only next team that could potentially take a flyer on him is the Indianapolis Colts. So the Bengals would kind of sense that, move up and take an absolute amazing weapon. T Higgins, he's probably playing his last year before you know they have to pay Jamar Chase. And this is kind of a best of both worlds move. They're gonna go all in this year to try and win a Super Bowl with you know amazing weaponry on offense. But even after T Higgins leaves, they're gonna have Brock Bowers to kind of step in and replace him as that number two role. So that's, what, that's kind of what we were thinking about of having Brock Bowers going to the Bengals, move up for him. There has been some talk about some team maybe not the Bengals, maybe just some other mystery team down the board moving up for bowers if he does slip past a certain point this mock draft we're going to have the Bengals doing that but the raiders are up next and i've had michael Penix going here a couple times i'm not going to do that today uh raider fans were very upset that we have ever even considered that so although i do think michael Penix has a pretty wide range just depending on the need the fit with teams just how they view them I think he could go as early as probably the Raiders right here. And then he can even potentially fall out of the first round. It really just depends. So we're not going to have the Raiders take a quarterback here. We're going to go with Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo, the best corner on the board, in my opinion. There's been a little bit of questions about, hey, he played in you know a smaller school. They kind of ran a weird defensive scheme. He wasn't impressed too much. But when you look at all of his measurables and also just his tape, his reaction time, just his instincts as a player, I think Quinion Mitchell is going to be a very, very nice player at the next level. And the Raiders, they need help outside of Nate Hobbs in their secondary. They need somebody to play on the other side of them. I could see offensive line here. That definitely is a possibility. But still, with the best corner on the board versus maybe taking the third tackle, maybe J.C. Latham going at 11 changes their mindset because maybe their second tackle falls to them. But I think Quinion Mitchell makes a lot of sense to the Raiders and they get you know, the number one corner here at number 13. This is how much doubt I have in Quinion Mitchell. It's zero. That's how much. Zero doubt. He's going to be a guaranteed stud for whatever team he goes to. I absolutely love him. 14, Saints. Uh, not going to tailor on this one. It's pretty much just offensive line. Get the best offensive lineman. I think the consensus board, and in my opinion, while Fashionu is definitely the possibility here, 
with the board looking how it is, I think Fuanga is the easy pick. Uh, he could play tackle or guard. Uh, they need help at that position for sure. They're trying to contend relatively. Uh, so go ahead and just get the best player at your highest position of need. Fuanga, great pick. Fitz, perfect. Yeah, I've said the same couple of things almost every mock draft since it's really came out that Ryan Ramscheck might not play next season for the Saints. They need help at tackle. It's pretty clear Trevor Penning has been a disaster at left tackle. So they need help getting somebody to step in to help them right away to win because Dennis Allen, he's on the hot seat. Derek Carr, this could be his last year in New Orleans if things go very, very poorly, which you know could happen if we look off how things went last year. So Talisa Fuaga, he can step in right away, be an impact player on the offensive line and fill kind of their big issue with Rams check potentially not playing. Tre Trevor Penning just not being very good. The Indianapolis Colts, I think Brock Bowers has become a pretty popular selection there, but we're going to go with the next best option. And that is Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. The Colts really just need some more weapons for their young quarterback and Anthony Richardson. Showed some potential last year as a rookie, but there are still some questions about his accuracy. How is he going to develop as a passer? And getting a big body guy that can go up and, you know, moss a corner or two, catch in traffic, that's really going to help with those accuracy problems. And that's why Brock Bowers, he made a lot of sense because Bowers is a big target, you know, with his size and, you know, his length, he's able to go to the middle of the field, snatch balls out of the air. Brian Thomas has that same ability, but he's just going to be doing it a little bit differently. So I do think he's going to fit outside, maybe be their ex wide receiver. You have Michael Pittman, who I do think is a really nice player, but I think he's better suited to be the wide receiver two for an offense. You have Josh Downs. He's better in the slot, kind of a slot only guy. You need a true number one wide receiver, Brian Thomas. I think he fits really nicely with the Colts and could be another awesome SEC player that the Colts added to their team. Yeah, I know that he has an average draft position of lower, like in the 20s, but I do think he's probably going to go higher, especially a lot of NFL people have kind of said that he will probably go higher than a lot of people think because he's a very good receiver. He's kind of the first player in that second tier of receivers. Uh, and I think it doesn't really matter who the Colts take. They're just going to take an athletic player. So whether that's a very athletic corner or a very athletic receiver, it's probably one of those two if they don't go up and get Bowers, uh, which I don't love the odds of that, but it's possible. Uh, so Brian Thomas makes sense. The Seahawks at 16, not going to go on with this one either. Uh, Troy Fautanu out of Washington just makes sense. Obviously, you know, Washington, Seattle, that's a pretty good correlation, but they need a line. They desperately do. Uh, I can't remember what video I had saw it in, but there was a Seahawks fan or two that was like, what are you doing? We don't need this position or O-line. I don't know what you're watching, <laughs> but you definitely do. Uh, and this is a perfect player because I think he can play all three. Guard, tackle, and center. I really do think he can play all three. I think originally it was thought he was just going to be on the interior, but his arms actually ended up being longer than we thought. So I think that really helps him potentially play tackle as well. Wherever he goes, I think he's just going to be a stud. So Seattle, just get an offensive lineman. And if Fautanu is somehow here, I think this is the easy pick for them. Yeah, I went back and forth of having a guard go here or maybe a pass rusher because Mike McDonald, their new coach, probably wants a new shiny weapon to have on his defensive unit. So maybe that's an option for them, but I do like Fatano just keeping him in the state of Washington, filling a massive hole on the offensive line. They want to try and support Geno Smith or maybe even Sam Howell if he can sneak onto the field. We'll see about that. But Troy Fatano, very nice player, very versatile. Like you said, Stone can play really all three positions. And now the Jacksonville Jaguars at pick 17. There's been a lot of smoke about them trading up for a wide receiver potentially. Maybe Roma Dunze. I think I had that mocked in my last draft, but I don't exactly know how that's really going to play out and if the Jaguars really want to use all that capital to do so. I mean, they do still have Christian Kirk. They do still have Gabe Davis. It's probably going to take a second and a third to move up maybe, what, seven or eight spots to get into range to get a Dunze. So do they want to have that much capital put up to get one of those wide receivers, we'll have to see. But if they do stick and pick at 17, I think a corner makes just the most sense. Terion Arnold, I think he's been a very popular pick that we've had go here all off season long. And it's a big need for the Jaguars. They lost Darius Williams. They lost Rayshon Jenkins. They need help in the back end of their defense. Arnold, I think he is kind of the consensus cornerback two. I guess some people have him as cornerback one, but he's my cornerback two. I think he makes sense to go here number 17 to the, to the Jags as they get a nice cornerback duo with Tyson Campbell. Pretty easy pick. We've had that for a while for the Jags if they stay there. 
18, I think this is just kind of has to be where Bonix goes. I know you made a trade. You got 49. He won't be available at 49. So if you pass on him, which is possible at the 18th pick, if you trade down, you're going to have to use probably 49 and maybe a future third or maybe that 76 pick or something else to get up and get him because there will eventually be a team where it's like, hey, yeah, let's go get this guy. He's too talented to fall this far. Um, so I think it just makes too much sense. Uh, Bo Nix, it just Broncos just seems like the fit that makes sense and will probably happen. I know there's been a lot of different stuff with the Broncos. They're kind of a, a weird team to mock, but at the same time, if you're just like realistically trying to pick for them, I think 10 times out of 10, you're going to say, okay, well, Bo Nix just seems like the correct pick there. So we're not going to buy into too many smoke and mirrors. They did trade down, which we like, but we just got to get Bo Nix. They need a quarterback. He's not obviously the highest ceiling, but I think he could be pretty solid. Sean Payton will get the most out of his quarterbacks. He'll be on a rookie deal. They could try and build the rest of the team. So I don't think it's that bad. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, we flirted with the idea of having them move back again and having another team move up. But again, it's just kind of hard to work out who's going to move up for who. So we decided to just have them stay here at 18, getting a little bit more assets. I do think the Broncos are a very... I, I guess high potential team to move back in the draft. And if they don't move back, I don't think they're going to take Knicks at uh, pick number 12. It just doesn't make a ton of logical sense. I guess if they really, really love them, they could, but I feel like it's a trade back and take Knicks or it's maybe just take a pass rusher or somebody and then figure out quarterback, maybe ride with Zach Wilson this year who they just traded for. I don't know. But I do think trading back, getting next is just the most logical sense for the Broncos. And here at number 19 for the Los Angeles Rams, I am going to have Leitu Latu go here, stay in the state of California. And again, I mentioned this before in my last mock draft as well. I'm a little bit worried in terms of just getting this prediction right, that Sean McVay is going to want to take someone on the offensive side of the ball. Offensive tackle is a very huge need on this team. We could definitely see that happening, but they also just really need a pass rusher. And I think the best player on the board at this point would be late to Latu if you are okay with the medicals. In terms of just pass rush moves and potential to be just an all out potential 15 plus sack guy, you know, at the peak of his career, I think that is Latu. He's just an all around amazing pass rusher. So Latu, I do think he's going to go somewhere in the middle of this first round. And I think the Rams could be a very nice fit. I was thinking about Jared Verse potentially, but Verse is more of a 4-3 defensive end. I think Latu has a better chance to drop back a little bit at times during a 3-4, pr provide a little bit of versatility there. Where Verse, I just think, you know, he doesn't really have a lot of bend. He's more of a power rusher. You don't really want those guys to be using a 3-4 scheme. So that's why I decided to go with Latu over Verse. But offensive line and offensive tackle could definitely be a pick if Sean McVay says, hey, I haven't had a pick in eight years. I want to go offense, but... For the sake of this, Latu. Next is the Steelers. Uh, yes, I do like Latu. Latu is obviously a great player, and I think the Rams just, it could be edge rusher, it could be corner, it could be tackle, a lot of different stuff. He's the best player, though, on the board that's left, so I think definitely worth taking. The Steelers. At 20, I think it just kind of has to be O-line in this first round, and obviously they don't really have a center on roster, so Graham Barton, Jackson Powers Johnson seems like a great pick, but I think tackle obviously we know is worth a little more, and they did use a tackle last year, their first round pick, but they still could use one, weirdly enough, so let's go with the best tackle on the board, Olu Fashionu out of Penn State. I do like this fit. I think it's pretty good. They took, obviously, a Penn State player last year in the second round with uh, Porter Jr., but I do think that if you are the Steelers and you are in the first round, you kind of just should take the best O-lineman available, and if there is a run of O-line in the beginning, I think, obviously, that assumes that Fashion U goes. Barton is probably the pick, or... You pair Mims with his Georgia teammate, one of those two. But it's going to be O-line. It has to be O-line in the first round. Makes sense. So let's go with the best one, Olu Fashionu. Yeah, I think the Steelers, it's really corner, wide receiver, or offensive line. And with having Brian Thomas go off the board here and them being a great developmental and scouting team in terms of wide receiver, it doesn't make sense to have them you know, take one here at 20 when they can probably, especially in a deep class, get one in round two, round three. So it's either offensive tackle or a corner. With the top two corners off the board, we decided to go with a tackle. And 
Olu Fashnu, definitely a guy that has potential right away to step in and be a great pass blocker. Needs some help in terms of being a run blocker a little bit, but he's got a great anchor and I think he'd be a great pairing with Broderick Jones who they drafted last year. Have two really bookend tackles, a young pairing for the next few years. And then the Miami Dolphins. This is another really interesting team because there's so many different routes they can go. I think in free agency, they really set themselves up to go BPA here just with getting a lot of depth in different areas, getting Johnny Smith at tight end, signing Shaquille Barrett to be an edge rusher. So they just got a couple of holes that they plugged. Uh, Aaron Brewer as well at center. So they don't have a desperate need at center like we originally thought early in the offseason, having JPJ go here, although, you know, he could play guard. But that's kind of my point is that the Dolphins are not really locked into a set position. I know offensive line has been a very popular pick here, but I'm going to have Jared Verse out of Florida State go to the Dolphins. And there's a couple of reasons for this. I think the Dolphins have a very strict, uh, I guess, type of offensive linemen that they have to get this draft because Teron Armstead, who is their left tackle right now, he has a lot of injury concerns. He misses a lot of games every season, but he's also said he's probably going to retire after this season. So theoretically, if you're the Dolphins, similar to what I was mentioning with the Jets, you don't want to draft a pure tackle because he's not going to be able to play from day one. The Dolphins are a team that's trying to win and they cannot get somebody like Amarius Mims, who is six foot seven and put him at guard. That's not going to work, especially with a smaller quarterback. Mims is not going to be able to play guard. So are you really going to take a guy here, have him sit on the bench for the first few weeks of the season, maybe even half the season? Let's just say Armstead misses half the year. Do you really want your first round pick to sit on the bench for half a season, especially when you're trying to win now? I don't know. That's a little bit interesting to think about. So when I think about players that could help right away and move to tackle after Armstead retires, it's maybe Graham Barton. It is maybe even Troy Fatanu. But Troy Fatanu, we have him going to Seattle. And Graham Barton, he is somebody that is in play here. But I just think with Jared Verse being on the board, the Dolphins going BPA, they're going to take Verse, who I think is a little bit higher on draft boards, I feel like consensus wise. So Jared Verse, you get another pass rusher to help out that unit. They do have Bradley Chubb, they do have Jalen Phillips, but they're both coming off of catastrophic injuries. Bradley Chubb, a torn ACL in late December. Jalen Phillips, an Achilles injury in the middle of November. Are those guys going to be ready for week one? Are they going to be ready for the first month of the season? Those timelines are always a little bit up in the air. So I think the Dolphins could still use a young pass rusher as well with Bradley Chubb. Probably not going to be on the team in two years because they have to pay Jalen Phillips soon. And you're not going to be able to pay two pass rushers 20 plus million dollars, you know, assuming that Phillips does get a long-term deal. So I think you get verse, you add him to that rotation for a year, and then you kind of reevaluate there. And I do like a trade back as well for the Dolphins. I could see a team moving up, but again, who is it going to be? Somebody can move for Nate Wiggins. Is it going to be in one of these tackles? It's just hard to predict when you don't know who you know other teams value and who they could be potentially interested in moving up with. So BPA, Dolphins get Jared Verse, and the Eagles are now on the clock. Yeah, Dolphins are a slightly harder team to pick for. I personally think, and I personally would go a different route, but... Uh, he is the best player. I think he's right there with Cooper DeGene. I think Cooper DeGene's probably just a better player, but they don't need to take that. So he's the next best player aside from Cooper DeGene. So makes, you know, it, it makes sense if you're going just BPA. Uh, then we have the Eagles at 22, and they could also go a number of different directions. Um, but I these last two picks, at least, I, I was kind of okay with whatever, you know, we were going to do. Um, I think DeGene would also be probably the most viable pick, but with his injury history, maybe the Eagles aren't really confident in that, and they want more of an outside corner to try and replace Slay and Bradbury. So we're going to go ahead and go with Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. His athleticism is insane, so uh, smaller in terms of his size. He's kind of lanky, but he is tall. Eagles, they want the next you know, Slay outside corner since they're older. Nate Wiggins, go ahead and get him at 22. Yeah, we went back and forth on maybe Cooper DeGene or Nate Wiggins because DeGene is just very versatile, would really fit nicely in a Vic Fangio scheme. But Nate Wiggins, he does fit as well. He's kind of a Darius Slay clone a little bit to me, just a smaller, super fast guy. And Howie Roseman, he does love traits. I think he would love to take a corner who ran a sub 4-3 at the 40-yard dash. So Nate Wiggins makes a lot of sense as the Eagles try to help out their secondary. All right, and then the Chargers are back on the board. And Charger fans, this one's on me. All right, uh, this one's on me. We could have gone a wide receiver here, Adonai Mitchell or some other person. But I'm going to have Mike Sandra still out of Michigan going here at number 23. Okay, so you get Mike Sandra still, you get JC Latham. I know you guys are very upset because we did not take, you know, a wide receiver. We didn't get, 
you know, the BPA that you would assume would be the correct picks here at 11 and 23. But when I think about Jim Harbaugh, he really values his own players that he's coached with in the past. And Mike Sanders still was a captain for multiple years at Michigan. He was really the leader and heartbeat of that Michigan defense. As the Chargers kind of rebuild and retool, I think they're going to want somebody like that on the defensive side of the ball. And it's not like Sanders still can't play. He's actually probably one of the more underrated players in this draft in terms of just how good of a football player he is. He doesn't have great measurables. He didn't test super well. And he's most likely going to be a nickel corner and somebody that can play safety a little bit. And we've seen that those positions are a little bit undervalued. But if you just look at the past couple of years with Brian Branch last year with, you know, the Detroit Lions and then the Kansas City Chiefs with Trent McDuffie, they have played really big roles in, you know, both those teams' defenses. So I feel like that position is gaining a little bit of momentum to become you know, maybe a borderline first round position again. And with the connection to Jim Harbaugh and the need still on the Chargers defense needing a cornerback, Mike Sanders still just makes a lot of sense for me. And I know Charger fans are not going to love it. They're going to be upset with it. Call it a reach, call it a bad pick. But I do think this is in play here. If you just think about all the connections, the need, and what Sanders still can bring to this team. All five Chargers fans are going to be really pissed at us for this mock. But... Crazy stuff happens all the time, and I would not be shocked if Harbaugh was like, we don't really care. We're just going to take these players. We know them. Um, but they could get a receiver like a Roman Wilson, who is also from Michigan in the second round. So that's kind of the thinking for that specific pick. Obviously, I wouldn't have done it, but I do love Mike Sanders still. I think he's a very underrated slot corner and will be a maybe sneaky late day one, but priority day two pick. Uh, then we have the Cowboys at here, kind of an easy pick as well. I've had a lot of the easy picks today. Uh, Graham Barton. It's either Graham Barton or Marius Mims. They've been linked to Graham Barton more. It just seems like, hey, this is your next center slash guard that is amazing for the Cowboys for the next 10 years. That's literally what Graham Barton feels like if he goes to the Cowboys. I think he'll go higher, but he's kind of varied in terms of like, yes, he's good, but his positional need or value might not be as high. Uh, but I think the Cowboys is a pretty perfect and easy spot for him so we'll have him go here to dallas yeah it makes a ton of sense they lost multiple offensive linemen this year seems like a pretty easy pick to have them go with here i've seen some people say hey maybe they're going to go out and get xavier worthy or maybe adonai mitchell keep one of those texas longhorn players in the state but i do think going offensive line makes a ton of sense we did go back and forth maybe having a marius mims just because of you know his high potential and the cowboys they're known for developing offensive linemen, turning them into really, really good players. So maybe that's a route they decide to go. But Graham Barton and just his versatility, it does seem like you know what the Cowboys would like to go after. And here at number 25, the Packers were probably crossing their fingers, hoping he would have been on the board for them to take. But I'm gonna have them go Cooper DeGene. I feel like we've had him slide far enough on uh, this board here. And it's really just because going back again to the nickel and kind of just that weird hybrid safety position it's not super valued by a lot of teams and when you're a team that needs a corner maybe like the eagles or even the jaguars you want to take a guy that is a set boundary guy has a ton of experience there where DeGene, we do not know 100 percent if he is going to be a full-time boundary guy so there are a little bit of questions there but he is going to be nice with the packers who do have a lot of questions in their secondary. Eric Stokes and Jair Alexander are really their only two corners right now, and they both have had a lot of injury concerns the last couple of years. They did sign Xavier McKinney to be their free safety, but they lost Darnell Savage, and they need somebody to pair with him. So Cooper DeGene could fit both of those as a guy who fits in the nickel, plays a boundary corner if one of those guys gets hurt, even plays, you know, safety next to Xavier McKinney. So there's a lot of things that direct me to having DeGene end up in Green Bay. They also took an Iowa product last year in Lucas Van Ness, so they do kind of value their Iowa Hawkeyes a little bit. So I do like DeGene fitting with Green Bay. Yes, I do love the fit of DeGene to Green Bay. I'm not sure if he'll fall this far, but it's very possible. He's pretty high volatile with uh, his range because of his injury. I had had him, I had had the Packers trading up in my uh, what I would do mock draft, which they never trade up. So obviously it's not realistic, but uh, that's because I value DeGene very highly and think he'll go before. But again, he could definitely go. Uh, they're at 25 if he falls. 26 to the Bucks. This has kind of been the pickle I've seen a lot of people make, and I think it fits because it's a position of need, and it gets a player that not everyone has as a first-round player into the first round pretty solidly. Like, pick 26, that's a lot of picks before the end of the first, if you're thinking about it. So uh, we'll go ahead and have him. It's an edge rusher. 
and I think everyone knows who it is. It is Chop Robinson out of Penn State. His physical traits are basically the reason he's going here. He's an insane athlete, has ideal physical traits, but he doesn't really have a pass rush that he even puts to on the field. Like it, it it's almost just like I'm gonna beat you because I'm faster, bigger, stronger. Which in college, that's gonna work every time. Which is why he was amazing. But his production even then wasn't crazy. It was just like, oh my god, he's getting so many pressures. He didn't convert a ton of them to sacks, however. And I think in the NFL, he is going to need to learn how to use a lot of different moves, like swim move, bull rush, all that good stuff. But I do think that with being, you know, in Tampa Bay, defense seems to be a, a pretty good thing that they do a good job coaching with Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles, I, I don't think super highly of, but I don't think very low of either. He's kind of like a fine coach, but he's a more defensive guy. So defensive players would probably be their need. Uh, and I think looking at all the positions they need, Linebacker, wouldn't take early. Running back, tight end, could be interior, but Jackson Powers Johnson, not sure you'd take him. Maybe that would definitely be a pick. Uh, so I like it. It makes sense. It's a little bit risky just because he's a very high uh, ceiling, low four player, but they needed the position and he'd be a very fun player to see develop in Tampa Bay. Yeah, you nailed it. A very traitsy player is very raw to not finish or have a lot of production at the collegiate level which definitely scares off a lot of teams but i do think he is going to sneak into the first round somewhere maybe it's earlier maybe it's you know towards the bottom you know even further down the board but i do think he's going to find himself into the first round and now the arizona cardinals this has been a bpa spot for me all mock draft season jerzon newton another player that could go a lot earlier potentially but i do think that you know, the Cardinals, just looking at the roster, they do need talent. And Jerzon Newton, he's a very talented player. A little bit undersized. He might not be super great against the run just because he's kind of easily moved off his spot. But in terms of an explosive pass rusher, which the Cardinals do need help getting after the quarterback, Jerzon Newton can provide a fairly good element of that to their defense. And the Cardinals get a pretty good first round with getting Newton and Marvin Harrison to be two cornerstone pieces of their, you know, kind of rebuild. 28 is a pretty easy pick. Yes, 27, I do agree. Jazan Newton, best player on the board, go get him. Uh, but 28, it's been linked because it just makes sense. Obviously with the Diggs trade, we had this before the Diggs trade even, uh, and it's Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. And he is the most volatile, almost player, to be honest. There has been a lot of stuff that's come out with him. If you don't know, go ahead and read up on it. Potential character issues, obviously his effort, was definitely something that was shown as not being great. Uh, you can't really play him on all three downs because his run blocking is zero. He doesn't really try if he's not getting the ball. So that's going to need to be fixed. But if you're trying to find a place, the Bills, Josh Allen has dealt with a player like that in Stephon Diggs. Adonai Mitchell's insanely talented. He's very young. So his ceiling is very high, almost like a, a CD Lamb type. But his floor is like pretty low. A guy who might like flame out and just explode in a very bad way it's a position of need it's the most talented guy if you want to go someone else i love lad mccocky obviously uh so i i think that would be there but they need some sort of like down the field thread at x uh so adonai mitchell he's taller pretty much fits and uh, that would be very interesting to see how he develops there yeah you raise some interesting points though if the bills do want to deal with another potential you know head case now that Diggs is gone obviously all of those reports you take with a grain of salt during draft time but interesting things raised up about Adonai Mitchell I do like the fit though getting kind of a deep threat for Josh Allen to replace Gabe Davis and also digs to an extent just being able to also run routes in the intermediate range so the bills get their wide receiver one and the detroit lions are on the board now they're always a team that's pretty hard to mock for because they just do pretty crazy things i mean they last year they took a running back they also took a linebacker in the first round two things that you know you really never see happen at least regularly happen in the nfl draft so i'm gonna have them take a corner but not kool-aid mckinstry who has been a pretty popular player to go here i'm actually gonna have ennis rakestraw jr just because it's a little bit out of left field but this is a position that the lions do need to address still they added a couple pieces in the offseason but they also did lose cj gardner johnson so they still have some 
some holes to fill. And in this rake stroll, he has a lot of traits, but his production at Missouri, and I guess his ball skills, just getting interceptions, pass deflections, all that, it was not exactly there for him. So that's why he might not be a first round player. But again, the NFL draft is about taking players based off of a projection. And Ennis Rakestraw is a guy that could become a fairly good player. And the Lions take a flyer on him here and do something a little bit out of the ordinary. Yeah, I know we both had kind of the feel that we wanted them to do something a little bit different. Obviously, Kool-Aid McKinstry would be an easy pick here. And that might be what they do. But I think we wanted to get a little bit crazy. Rakestraw or TJ Tampa. I think it'd be there if you want to get even crazier. Maybe you could go Kamari Lasseter or Matt, Max Melton. Um, or a guy who I had them in the second round mocked and who I think it could be possible that he goes at 29. Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, and that's Marshawn Neeland out of Western Michigan, the edge rusher. They might not just care at all and be like, hey, we're going to take the player we like. We don't care about value. They didn't last year, as you said. So maybe that happens. But trying to see if we can kind of predict something crazy to happen relatively with the Lions. With the Ravens, this player is still on the board crazy enough, and I think it'd be they would sprint to turn the card in uh, if he's still here. And that's Amarius Mims out of Georgia. If he's not there, it could be wide receiver like Ladd or maybe a different tackle like maybe if Morgan or Guyton is there. Um, but Amarius Mims, I think, is a stud. This would be a steal, in my opinion, if they get him here. He's, he's raw in the sense he just hasn't played a lot of snaps. He looked very good when he played. He just didn't play a ton so maybe he could get even better uh with the ravens here at 30 but absolutely love this pick if they were able to get him this late yeah this has been something i really liked just in terms of fit all offseason the ravens really like their large humans that tackle they're really good at developing them and mims as you mentioned just has some red flags because he only played eight games across three years at georgia and it was because of injuries and also was because he couldn't really get on the field to start because you know georgia they're just always loaded with talent. But we did see him last year when he was able to stay healthy and be on the field. And he was a fairly productive player. But with all these other tackles with a little bit less risk and still just being really good players, I do think there's a chance that Mims could find himself on the board here towards the end of the first round. And the Baltimore Ravens get a flyer on a really high potential guy. And the 49ers kind of get the exact same thing with Jackson Powers Johnson going here. They need help on their interior of their offensive line. And JPJ, he might be the best center slash guard, you know, whatever you want to call it in this draft. There has been some questions about his medical. I think he had like some neck injury in high school. And that's kind of been lingering, I guess, according to some of the medical reports that have come out. Who knows if that makes him fall this far? I mean, I remember during early parts of the process, he was going in the you know 18 to 21 range, either to the Steelers, the Dolphins, to maybe even the Jags. And now he's kind of towards the bottom of the first, maybe not even going in the first round. But with the 49ers having a very, you know, zone heavy run offense and needing their offensive lineman to get up to the second level a bunch, I think JPJ is a great fit there. He as he can really, really move. He also has a very nice anchor in the passing game. And if the 49ers do not want to play him at center right away, he can start into either guard spot as well. So yeah, the 49ers and Ravens, two teams that made really good pushes last year in the playoffs, get some more offensive line help with really high potential play players pretty late in the first round then we have the kansas city chiefs the final pick uh mathis had picked tyler guyton i personally would go jordan morgan or receiver but it doesn't really matter because tackle could be a very well position and it's going to be guyton or morgan uh so in this case they would go guyton more of a developmental tackle um but has very good traits and will seemingly probably go higher than this it seems like all the mocks i've seen have him pretty high because teams apparently really love his traits so that will probably be the pick here, but Xavier Worthy could absolutely be it too if they just want to go get speed, just crazy, or just some kind of other receiver with Rasheed Rice's, you know, potential suspension. We still don't know all about that. But Juwan Taylor is like their only other tackle they have right now, and he was not great either, so he's going to have to start. So I would kind of focus tackle as well. Uh, but then I want to do one last shout out to all Panthers fans out there who obviously are sulking because they don't have a first round pick, which includes myself because I'm a Panthers fan, uh, and just mention kind of what we are thinking they might do. Uh, and it's probably receiver, although I will say I do think that cornerback could be the pick as well uh, earlier, depending on kind of what they feel, or they could just trade back from 33 because they do have 33 and 39. So I think it'll be some kind of combination of receiver and corner. All the reports, at least from what I've kind of seen, while I would love Lad McConkey or Ricky Pearsall, those are kind of my guys. Uh, this other player I do like, and it makes sense, uh, and that's Xavier Leggett 
out of South Carolina. That's kind of who the Panthers have been linked to, done a lot of interviews with, and it makes sense. He is a bigger body receiver. He's only started one like year with good production, so that's a little bit worrisome. He is a very big, strong athlete, but he's not super fast. He doesn't get a lot of separation, uh, but his contested catch rate was great. So that's kind of the player he is, and they already traded for Deontay Johnson. They have, you know, uh, an old, but still a uh, viable Adam Thielen in the slot and guys like Ladd McConkey, Ricky Pearsall they're kind of similar to Deontay Johnson so it makes sense to get a bigger receiver in Leggett but that was just a shout out for the Carolina Panthers uh, but Tyler Guyton is the final pick to end it off for this mock draft yeah the Chiefs definitely could go wide receiver there are still just a lot of question marks regarding that receiving core although they did pick up Hollywood Brown so maybe they like to go that route maybe they even like to go corner if they really like Kool-Aid potentially because we did not have him here in our first round but I just think Tyler Guyton a guy that again has just crazy potential but is very raw could be something that Andy Reid looks at and goes hey we could add this guy in by the end of the season. He could be a really, really good player for us. And trying to protect Patrick Mahomes, you know, the best quarterback in the league, you know, your by far highest investment on the entire roster. You want to make sure that he's protected. So I do think getting a very nice high potential tackle here could make sense. If the board does fall like this and there's not a wide receiver they could trade up for or they're not in love with. But that is going to do it for our official predictions. This is what we think is going to happen at the NFL draft in just a couple of days. Let us know in the comment section down below what you think about it. If you disagree, who you think your team is going to draft and kind of your reasoning behind it. As always, I will have Stone stuff in the description. Go check him out. He has done you know, a couple other draft videos about some other prospects. So go check that out. And also I do want to shout out, we might be doing a draft live stream on Thursday. I'm still a little bit up in the air about it, but I am considering doing it. So if you are interested in that and wanting to hear our opinions on each pick and also just be able to share your thoughts with us as well, we might be going live for the draft. I'll let you guys know ahead of time if I do decide to do that. But subscribe to the channel if you are new. Drop a like on the video if you did enjoy it. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you guys on my next one.